Welcome to another episode of the podcast of the History Teachers Association of New South Wales. My name's Jonathan Dallymore, and today's episode is actually the first of two, in which I sat down to talk to Professor Stephen Hodkinson from the University of Nottingham in the UK. Professor Hodkinson is an internationally renowned scholar of ancient Sparta, and he's been in Australia the last few weeks running a series of lectures for Academy Travel and HGA New South Wales. I'd like to quickly thank Academy Travel for bringing Stephen to Australia, and also thanks Stephen for giving his time in the middle of a very busy schedule. In this first episode, Stephen and I talked about the idea of the Spartan Mirage, and also we talked about a range of different specific features of Spartan society. In the second episode, we plan to cover issues relating to how Stephen sees Spartan society in general, the role of archaeology, and also the way Spartan history has been appropriated by different groups throughout time. If you'd like to know more about Stephen's work, then please visit the website for the Centre for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies, which he founded with a colleague in 2005. And that can be found at www.nottingham.ac.uk forward slash CSPS. And now here is the first of two interviews with Stephen Hodkinson. Uh, Hi, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. I wondered if you could just start by telling us how you became a Spartan specialist. Okay, well, at school I was most interested in modern history, um, but then I went to do my undergraduate degree in history at the University of Manchester, and their course covered everything from ancient Greece uh, through to uh, the, the present. And I was captivated by the very first uh, module I took on ancient Greece. And that led on in my third and final undergraduate year to taking uh, a course called uh, Athens and Sparta. Um, At first I thought that Athens was the more interesting, but the more I got into this course, it was Sparta that that, that was uh, captivated my imagination. Um, And that was because I came to realise that so little work had been done on Sparta. Uh, We're talking now back in 1973-74 when I was an undergraduate. And um, Sparta at that time had been a taboo subject since World War II because of the way that the Third Reich had uh, appropriated Sparta. So um, it was only 30 years or so later that uh, um, scholars were starting to uh, re-study Sparta. And I came to realise that even as an undergraduate, I I could do original uh, work on Sparta and come up with new ideas that hadn't been covered. And so um, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Spartan kings. And then I went to Cambridge to do my PhD um, working under um, Sir Moses Finlay. And um, I worked on um, Spartan politics and society initially, but then gradually became more interested in in the economy. So that um, when I then got my first uh, lecturing post, which was back at the University of Manchester in 1977, I um, focused above all on Sparta, and I've been working on Sparta now for uh, over 40 years. So a long and distinguished career. I wanted to start by talking about this concept of the Spartan Mirage, if that's okay. So I just wondered if you could flesh out what what people talk about or what they mean when they bring up this concept of the Spartan Mirage. Okay. Um, I think we need to start by um, indicating that we're talking about Sparta primarily of the 5th and 4th centuries BC, um, what, what's um, often called the, the classical period. Um, that's the period of Spartan history when Sparta was at its greatest power and when it had its uh, most distinctive um, form of society and lifestyle. Um, Now, in that period, um, Sparta was one of the two major powers in the Greek world. Um, Sparta combined with Athens to defeat the Persian invasions in the early 5th century, Um, but then the two states entered a period of imperial uh, rivalry which culminated in the uh, Peloponnesian War uh, in the final 30 years of the, of the 5th century. Now, we have very few native Spartan sources. Um, almost all our evidence comes from other states and, above all, from Athens, Sparta's imperial rivalry. So that's where the uh, mirage uh, starts, first of all. Um, a number of 5th century Athenian writers including Thucydides and Euripides, um, 
put very negative images of Sparta um, as a polar opposite to the uh, the uh, democratic demographic democratic and uh, naval uh, regime that, that uh, Athens had. Um, and in contrast, certain of the Athenian uh, aristocratic class um, who were disgruntled at the rise of Athenian democracy, which removed some of their power, looked to Sparta uh, as a positive model of, of how, how a state should be organised, so tended to idealise and, and overstress Sparta's uh, positive elements. Um, so these um, opposing uh, perspectives on Sparta um, an idealising mirage and, and a, very, a very negative mirage um, continue while Sparta is a major power until around 370 BC. And then going on into uh, the Hellenistic period, Sparta's power declines, but um, Sparta is taken up by Hellenistic um, philosophers who um, idealise her as a, a moral ideal um, a simple austere way of life, which they, they, they exaggerate in, in, in its details. And this um, um, great welter of uh, moral, moralizing ideas about Sparta are then encapsulated by Plutarch in his Life of Lycurgus, written in the uh, late 1st, early 2nd century AD, who focuses on Sparta's lawgiver, Lycurgus, uh, almost certainly a legendary figure, but Plutarch uses him in order to um, imagine uh, the way of life that, that he constructed, and, and it and it's, 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 uh, has all the um, moral virtues that, 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 that Plutarch sort of uh, uh, saw fit uh, as a sort of a, a Neoplatonist. So there's this ancient mirage to start off with, um, and then if we jump um, the best part, of, uh, jump over a millennium to the Renaissance, um, in the um, reawakening of interest in antiquity that takes place particularly in Italy um, in the uh, late medieval, uh, early modern period, Sparta is seen uh, as a, a one of the major um, ancient models for how a republic ought to be organised. And through the 15th to the 17th century, um, Sparta is regarded in a very positive terms as a well-balanced um, state that has good arms, it's an effective military force, but also good laws. Um, and um, Sparta is often regarded as the, the ideal model of, of how an ancient republic was organised and therefore uh, as a suitable um, exemplar for, for how modern uh, republics uh, could, could be organised. So we find um, Sparta being idealised within the Italian Renaissance, um, also within the um, the 16th century, um, so I mean 17th century, uh, English uh, Revolution, often called the English Civil War, um, where the more radical think thinkers picked upon Sparta um, during the Commonwealth period, um, the period of uh, Oliver Cromwell's rule, when they were imagining how a, uh, a new Commonwealth without a, a king could, could be organised, and, and Sparta is one of their positive models. And then going on into the 18th century, um, Sparta is picked upon by what's often known as the, the radical enlightenment, especially in France, where there's massive critiques of the French Bourbon monarchy, and Sparta is seen as a, a simpler, purer society, lacking the luxury of the, the Bourbon court. And in the so-called uh, pre-revolution, the uh, ideas that sort of uh, form the intellectual foundation for the French Revolution, uh, Sparta is a very powerful um, almost a commun communitarian um, model for, for alternative society. Now, all that changes um, in the years either side of 1800, um, because with the American and French revolutions and the rise of liberal thought um, in, in Europe in the early 19th century, um, the whole intellectual and political um, atmosphere changes. And... Um, Sparta is seen as no longer relevant to uh, a modern, uh, liberalising, industrialising uh, society. Uh, it's seen in negative terms as a, an old-fashioned, agrarian, militaristic state. And so the idea of the Spartan military becomes the dominant focus, but it is seen in negative terms uh, compared to the emerging um, Prussian-German uh, militaristic state of the 
of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And above all, um, Sparta's ne negative image um, derives from the fact that um, it was taken up by the Third Reich. Um, the Nazis um, used Sparta as one of their main prototypes for how they might um, radically uh, reorganize uh, German society. And the Nazis even believed there was a biological and racial continuity between themselves as the, uh, and the Spartans. Um, the Spartans were the uh, leaders of the, uh, uh, the Dorian race, so the Nazis imagined, uh, a race which had come down from the north and therefore was uh, uh, northern European. And the uh, Nazis saw, saw um, contemporary Germans as being the leaders of the, the, uh, the current uh, um, Aryan race which um, had a direct biological and racial ancestry from the, uh, um, from, from the, from the Dorian Spartans. And then, um, jumping on a bit further, um, in the present day, of course, images of Sparta are very much dominated by the, um, the graphic novel and the film 300, which we'll you know, come on to talk about in more detail. And uh, in particular, right-wing movements in the USA um, here in Australia uh, and also in Greece and other parts of Europe have uh, adopted Sparta as, as models for, for their, their far-right uh, political agendas. So if we begin to try to uh, unpack this mirage or, or get underneath the mirage and see Sparta a bit more clearly and perhaps on the basis of more hard evidence, I wonder if we could just start by exploring this concept of, of how exceptional Sparta was. It seems to be one of the, the dominant sort of themes of thinking about Sparta as this like um, society apart from others. What, what do you think about that idea? Well, um, it's, I hope it's become uh, evident from what I've been saying about the mirage that both the idealising and the, the negative images um, s single out Sparta as, as being singular, uh, unique, um, either in a positive or a, a negative sense. Um, and in terms of, of um, the reality, um, yes, there are certain things about Sparta that are distinctive, but that will be true of almost any Greek city-state. Um, in particular, uh, Athens was radically different from many other city-states in, in its, uh, um, its naval empire, the extent of, of, it, of its power, and, and its uh, very, very radical democracy. Um, and so there are distinctive elements about Sparta, um, in particular, there's the public upbringing that the uh, Spartans give all their boys. Um, it's the only state-organised public upbringing in, in classical Greece. And likewise, um, Spartan girls too have, have a, a certain amount of, 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 of upbringing in public, particularly a physical uh, education in public, which um, shocked uh, observers from, from Athens and from certain uh, other states. So there are distinctive elements, but um, both ideologues and even, I'm afraid, modern scholars have tended to exaggerate these distinctive elements and portray Sparta as if it's different in all respects. And it isn't really. Um, to go back briefly to the education system, the external sources always look for the exotic elements that are different. So they emphasise the heavy uh, physicality of the both the male and the female upbringing um, but ignoring the fact that um, certainly for Spartan um, young boys uh, there was also alongside the physical upbringing um, a normal private education in uh, in letters and, 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 and music and, and all the sort of things that the boys in other Greek city-states would, would, would be learning. And in general, um, I think the way I would put it is that um, the Spartans are exceptional in that they're able to develop certain Greek ideals to um, a much greater degree than is possible in other city-states. So, for example, it's an ideal um, for all citizens um, in different cities to have as much leisure as possible and and not to have to have to work uh, their lands um, in order that they can devote their time to all their, their civic and their military duties. Now, in most city-states, only an elite, a wealthy elite, can do that. They alone 
uh, can um, afford to have the, the slave labour to work their estates. Most citizens in most city-states have to work their own farms or their, their craftsmen. Um, but Sparta sets up a system whereby all its citizens are, have a, a basic amount of, of land that's worked by their helot slaves and the helot slaves deliver the produce that enables the Spartans to live a life, life of leisure and devote their time to um, uh, their civic as, as well as their, their private personal affairs. So Sparta is exceptional in the sense that all its, its citizens, all the, all the so-called Spartiates, um, can live this life of leisure. But that's um, an extreme development of a common Greek ideal that all Greek states would have liked to achieve, but only Sparta is able to do so. Probably connected to some of those ideas is a view that Sparta was kind of run like a totalitarian state. So civic life was all-encompassing um, and everything that was done on a daily basis sort of was done for the, the public, for the state, etc. How do historians tend to think about this now? Right, well, um, historians um, are still arguing and disagreeing. Um, and, As they should know, be, that's good. <laughs> precisely. Uh, and, and so the views I'm you know, going to put to you today uh, are often quite controversial. Uh, that's one of the exciting things about being a, a Spartan historian today. But um, the way, the way I, I would, would see it is that there's a certain level of um, uniformity in Spartan lifestyle. All Spartans live um, a common way of life. Um, just to step back a bit historically, we're talking about classical Sparta, 5th and 4th centuries BC. In the period before that, um, the archaic period, 8th, 7th, 6th centuries BC, there's evidence that Sparta was a normal Greek state with massive differences between rich and poor. There's what's often called a 6th century revolution, that's an entirely modern term, but it's a useful concept, um, whereby um, the rich in Sparta were pressurised by poorer Spartans to, uh, to moderate their lifestyle and to um, share a uniform lifestyle that all Spartans lived, rich or poor, except for the two kings and their immediate heirs. And this lifestyle involved um, being in the public upbringing from age 7 to age 30, and then at age 20... Um, you join both a, a common mess, a sort of dining group in which you eat your evening meal with, with, a, with a group of 15 or so messmates, and you also join the army. And you remain in the army for 40 years, um, you're uh, liable for military service, and you remain in your, your mess group, um, the Greek term for that is sisition, um, for the rest of your life. And so there are these common elements... And there are certain sort of other sort of um, aspects of Spartan life too. At age 60, all, all Spartans are eligible to be uh, elected to the council of the Gerizia, the council of their elders. Now, it's very easy to step beyond that overall framework that equalises uh, the lifestyle of all Spartans, rich or poor. It's easy to step beyond that, to believe that that means that every act, aspect of Spartan life is controlled. Yes, for the, most part, for the most part, you have to spend your evening meal uh, eating with your comrades. But the evidence suggests that um, until the evening meal, um, Spartan lifestyles are very flexible. We often have the image, and this comes across in films and modern novels and so on, the Spartans spend all their time um, congregating en masse, uh, typically doing their military training. Um, but episodes that we, um, where we learn about Spartan daily life, particularly in Xenophon's work, his Hellenica, um, seem to indicate Spartans going about their own private business, um, doing things independently. Um, in one incident in particular, the uh, famous conspiracy of Kinodone, we see some Spartans um, in the Agora, um, either doing commercial business or, or discussing um, political affairs with the officials. Um, other Spartans are walking the streets in ones and twos, and uh, yet other Spartans are out on their country estates uh, supervising their helots uh, um, um, far farming the land. Um, so it seems to be that Spartan life has a great degree of leisure. 
um, for engaging in a range of activities. You can follow your own personal schedules. Um, there are particular duties. Um, every Spartan is expected to keep fit and attend the, uh, the gymnasium. Um, and there are other uh, groups that you belong to as a Spartan. Um, one um, poet um, says the Spartan are like a cicada keen for the dance. And um, choruses where Spartans sang and danced together uh, are, are another key aspect of Spartan life. Um, so there are communal activities, um, but they don't uh, dominate every moment of life. Life is not organised from, uh, from, from dawn till dusk. And a lot of these um, communal activities take place not in great big crowds, but in smaller groups. Um, the mess is about 15 men, the chorus is no doubt also relatively small, um, and um, um, uh, team ball games and so on, where, where the people are picked individually, obviously against small groups. Um, and we can imagine that a lot of the Spartan life um, takes place in these small groups where there's a lot of initiative to actually um, organise the group in, in, in a way that you, that you uh, think fit and um, lots of personal interactions with, with, with changing groups of people. So Spartan life is, is quite, quite diverse um, within this common framework. Probably connected to that idea is um, conceptions about the military taking up you know, the major part of a Spartan's kind of life, particularly in men. What, uh, what are some of the ways you could challenge these perceptions about Spartan military culture? Well, as you correctly say, it's commonly thought the Spartans spent uh, all their time on military training. Um, in fact, there's very little evidence for Spartan military training. Um, there's no evidence for weapons practice. There's no evidence for uh, mock combats of the sort that you get described, say, in Stephen Pressfield's uh, uh, novel, uh, Gates of Fire. Where Xenophon, um, in his work, The Constitution of Sparta, um, talks about uh, how adults keep fit for war, uh, they do so by going out hunting. Um, hunting in ancient Greece is on foot, so it's good fitness training. And, and he says that uh, adults over 30 um, should hunt regularly in order that they can withstand the rigours of soldiering n uh, no less than the younger men. And in this respect, Sparta is um, typical of the ancient Greeks. That They didn't seem to think that, uh, that fighting as a hoplite required specialised training. It seemed to be regarded as uh, natural that a man um, from boyhood onwards would know how to operate, uh, use a spear uh, and a sword and, and, and a shield. So um, the Spartans share the general e ethic that uh, fitness is the key thing, to be able to, 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 to withstand a hard march and then a hard, hard battle uh, after that. The only aspect where we do have evidence for the Spartan having training that is not found in other states is in Spartan drill. And by that, that I mean learning how to march in order and to perform um, manoeuvres without the, the phalanx getting into dis dis disarray. And um, Xenophon, in his Constitution of Sparta, describes a, a particular counter-marching drill whereby the Spartans very efficiently can um, turn their army around if the enemy appears from the rear. They, they can move, move their files and, and uh, um, end up back in original formation, uh, but, but uh, facing the enemy. But Zephon also goes on to say that this drill is extremely simple. It's far more simple than, you, than outsiders uh, think, because you simply have to follow the man in front. Um, the phalanx is organised into files of typically you know, eight deep, and as long as you recognise the man in front of you and follow what he does, and he follows the, the file leader, and, and all the files make the coordinated action, um, then this drill, drill is, is quite simple to operate. And there's very, one very practical reason why the army has to have a simple drill, and that's that we often talk about the Spartan army. Um, that's a misnomer. Um, the ancients always talk about the Lacedaemonians. Um, by the Lacedaemonians, they mean the Spartiates, you know, the group we talk about, call the Spartans, and also a group called the Perioikoi, mm -hmm. 
who are free inhabitants of Spartan territory. They live not in Sparta itself, but in communities scattered around Sparta's uh, quite large territory. Um, and they're free, and they share a lot of the values of the Spartans, and they form 50% or more of the Lacedaemonian army in, in, in the classical period. Now, most uh, of these paranoikoi, these are normal Greek communities, most of them are working farmers. They haven't got um, lots and lots of time to devote to military training. So there has to be a drill that can be learnt readily, easily by part-time soldiers uh, and, and so that the army can, can manoeuvre uh, effectively. And so we've got this drill that makes the Spartan army just that bit better than other armies. Um, they march into battle in a more organised way without uh, disrupting their, their, their battle line. And also um, the Spartans have a very effective command structure um, that organises this drill. Um, Thucydides, when he describes the Battle of Mantinea in 418, um, when he's describing the preliminaries to the battle, um, remarks how um, satisfied the command structure of the um, Spartan army is. There are four levels of officers under the king, whereas most Greek uh, armies have two or at most three levels of officers. And Thucydides says that because, uh, to put it in his words, almost the entire army consists of officers commanding other officers, um, orders come down from the king very quickly and very effectively, and the, 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 the lowest level of officer pass it on to, to their, their, their units. And so effective orders and effective drill give Sparta the edge over other cities. They don't need to be that much better to, to be better than, 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 than in the most part than, than the armies of other city-states. So there's probably a few sayings that, um, you know, famous sayings from Sparta that have come down to us in pop culture. One of them would be, you know, the Spartan mothers saying to their sons as they go off to war, come back with your shield or on it. Um, and, and this probably hints at some kind of general views about Spartan women. But again, they, they seem to be fairly superficial and fairly sort of simple views. Um, what, what's the kind of general thinking about the role of Spartan women these days? Right, well, let's start with this sort of uh, you know, famous with this or on this uh, phrase, you know, come back with your shield or, or, or uh, uh, dead on it. Um, this is almost certainly an invented saying, or at least invented after the classical period, because we know from both um, literary texts and from archaeological evidence that uh, fallen Spartan warriors were never brought back to Sparta on their shields. They were always buried either on the battlefield itself or in neighbouring friendly territory if, if the battlefield was in, was in enemy territory. And we have one marvellous um, archaeological site which bears this out um, in the, uh, um, the site of the Kerimikos in Athens there's the monumental remains of a uh, Lacedaemonian communal um, tomb for um, a small number of Lacedaemonian soldiers who died in King Pausanias' expedition to Athens in 403 BC. And um, this tomb is mentioned uh, by Xenophon in Helenica, also mentioned in one of Lysias' speeches, and the, uh, the, the tomb itself uh, survives in its foundations, and uh, it was excavated in the, um, in the, the 1930s by, by the German school, and um, they excavated the um, skeletons buried in, in, the, uh, in the tomb. So um, it's clear that in, in classical times, um, if, if a soldier died, um, he was buried abroad in a communal tomb along with his comrades. Um, back home in Sparta, uh, he could have a, a small memorial which just gave his name and said, uh, in war. So this um, famous saying of Spartan women, which seems to typify the, uh, the, the fierce Spartan mother who would rather her son die than come back a, a, a coward, um, is either totally apocryphal, or if you want to salve it, it, you could argue that it might relate to the period when Sparta is invaded for the first time. Um, in 317 BC, Sparta is uh, invaded, and there are subsequent battles near Sparta um, through the, the uh, 
later 4th and the 3rd centuries BC. It may be, we don't know for certain, but it may be that in those circumstances um, the soldiers would have, would have been buried, would, would have been brought back on their shields. Um, but that's the only way that you can salvage uh, any, any truth behind that saying. Um, and more generally, um, Spartan women, yes, they have a lot to either gain or lose according to how their menfolk perform in battle. When Xenophon talks about the penalties inflicted upon cowards, one of the penalties is that the um, the coward will have to answer to his women folk for why they're not able to get husbands. Um, and you can imagine that there will be a, a barrier to um, a young Spartan man marrying a woman whose male relative had had, had, had been deemed a, been deemed a coward. But. We shouldn't think that uh, women's lives are totally uh, dominated by the military. The latest research on Spartan women shows that they're, um, they have a far wider range of interests. And what's often not um, taken into account sufficiently is that women are major landowners, um, in contrast to, to Athens, where women could not own landed property. Um, Aristotle says that almost two-fifths of the land is in the hands of women. And it seems quite... Uh, well, he mentions that there are many heiresses, and by that he means um, women who had no brothers or no surviving brothers, and therefore they inherit all their parental property. Um, but also he says that there, there are very large dowries. And um, this is a bit controversial, but but I've reinterpreted what Aristotle says um, along the lines that all Spartan daughters have a right to a, sh to a share of the parental property, and that um, if we assume that the share was um, one half of a son's portion, so if you have um, if a family had one daughter and one son, the son would get two thirds of the, of the property, and the daughter would get uh, one third, uh, half of her brother's share. Um, that was a system we know in, in Crete, um, in the city of Gortin, because it's in the Gortin Code. If we assume that that was also uh, in place in Sparta, um, by some rather complex mathematical calculations, you can work out that this would actually produce uh, about 40% of the land in, in female hands. So th th there is some, some grounds for thinking that that might have been the Spartan system. Now, the fact that women are major landowners um, has for them both negative and positive consequences. Um, the negative consequences are that um, their marriages are crucially important because they will bring wealth to um, whichever young man uh, uh, marries them. And therefore, it may well be that their families exercise greater than normal control over whom um, uh, a young girl w w w w would marry because that's a way of forming alliances. But on the other hand, um, once married, they come into the marriage as significant landowners and therefore with um, a greater degree of potential say in the running of the household. And one thing we learn about Spartan women is that they, they, they are said to, you know, to control the, the, their households uh, very effectively. And so women themselves therefore have a strong investment in um, building up the family property um, and we even find some women um, you know, among the very elite who use their wealth um, for their own personal prestige. Um, in the early 4th century, there are Spartan women who are breeding teams of horses and entering them in the Olympic Games and even, even uh, winning Olympic victories. Uh, and in particular, a woman called Kiniska, uh, who is the uh, member of, of the Europe Royal House. Um, she uh, was the first woman in Greece to be the uh, owner of a victorious four-horse chariot in the Olympic Games in the 390s BC, and she set up her own uh, monument uh, at Olympia, uh, a grandiose uh, monument with um, her own personal statue, the statue of her, uh, the male driver of the chariot, the four horses, um, and this... Uh, she also had a, it was it was commissioned by from a foreign sculptor, a man called Apelles uh, from Megara, and uh, there's an inscription on the base of the statue which um, survived in the Olympian Museum, 
which uh, says, you know, kings of Sparta were my father and brothers, um, Iconisca, uh, conquering with a, a, uh, a team of fleet-footed horses, um, set up this statue, and I proclaim myself the only woman in all Hellas to have achieved this crown. Um, so, uh, and Kaniska is the first, but, but not the last uh, uh, Spartan woman to win an Olympic um, uh, uh, chariot race. Um, so women have their own personal agendas, particularly if they're wealthy women. And they, this is all part of family strategies for, for building up um, the, the, the power of, of a particular kinfolk. So one common story about Sparta is that it's kind of spurred into this hypervigilance by this helot revolt in the 460s. And I saw in your essay for the Macquarie History Association, Ancient History Association that you sort of said that, that that sort of oversimplifies the picture of this. So what what place do the helots play in this society? Well, the helots are absolutely fundamental. Um, modern research now sees them as private slaves um, owned by individual Spartans um, rather than um, as state-owned slaves. But um, there's still strong communal elements that control how the Spartans can use their private slaves. Um, the Spartan system could not have run without uh, the helots because it's they that farm the Spartan estates, that provide the produce that enables the Sp Spartiates to live their, uh, their life of leisure. And um, it's very easy when thinking about slave populations to think of them as downtrodden um, and there's no doubt that Spartan control of the helots could be extremely brutal. Um, the infamous Cryptea, um, whereby certain elite young Spartans went out into the countryside, um, according to uh, Plutarch, who uh, records his ideas as coming from Aristotle, uh, talks about one, one of their roles being to cull helots who, who are either breaking the curfew by being out at night um, or uh, helots that uh, are more sturdy and therefore potentially liable to um, to cause trouble. So um, Spartan treatment of, of the helots could be very severe, but um, we needn't imagine that their daily lives were necessarily always very closely controlled by the Spartiates. That may have been true um, for those who farmed estates close to Sparta, where the, the, um, the master could go out to his estates, as described in the by Xenophon describing the conspiracy of Kinodone. But Spartan territory is quite extensive. The more distant parts of um, Messenia, the territory to, to the west of uh, um, Sparta's home territory of Laconia, um, the western edge near uh, ancient Pylos was a good 70 kilometres as, as the crow flies from, from, from Sparta itself. Um, and so we can't imagine the Spartiates themselves intervened very frequently in those estates. And the archaeological evidence um, indicates that um, helots in those regions lived in, in, um, in villages rather than in scattered farmsteads. So they probably um, self-organised um, their way of life and, and their farming to, to a certain extent um, under a, a generalised potential Spartan threat, but, but not one that's necessarily there on a daily basis. And this is quite a common pattern in agrarian slavery in many slave systems uh, within Russian serfdom uh, and, and within pre-colonial uh, Africa, whereby you get slave villages which are, are many kilometres uh, distant from, uh, from where the master is living, and where within those villages certain helots um, acquire privileges and become kind of village leaders and, and help to you know, maintain law and order and organize and supervise um, the labor of, of, of other slaves. And so um, we can imagine that in the more distant regions, the, uh, um, the helot life w was um, approached as near as, as could be possible for a, a slave population, um, a normal Greek rural uh, agrarian life. Um, now, the other side of the coin to that is that um, um, on the occasions when helots do go into revolt, it's above all in Messenia um, that the helots seem to be better able to sustain lengthy revolt. So the, the revolt of the 460s BC um, took, according to Thucydides, uh, you know, 10 years to put down. 
and the rebels um, uh, were able to organise themselves around Mount Ithomy and eventually the Spartans had to um, uh, agree a truce whereby the Helots could, could, could depart uh, and depart with their, their wives and their children because they, they have family structures. Um, so um, in normal times the Helots simply work the Spartans' lands but at times they have the capacity to, to organise and, and, and form a, 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 a serious revolt. But we should imagine that this was um, an everyday threat for the Spartans. Um, we learn from Xenophon that the Spartans went about their daily lives unarmed. They didn't carry weapons. And uh, even when they were out on their estates um, supervising the, their helot labourers and, and vastly outnumbered, um, they obviously didn't, didn't feel um, in daily threat of, of insurrection. Um, so I'd see the, um, the helot danger to the Spartans as being occasional, uh, prompted by particular circumstances. And what, above all, prompted the 480s, sorry, 460s revolt was a uh, massive earthquake that, that, that shook Sparta and caused a uh, um, significant loss of life and therefore presented with the helots with a, an unusual opportunity to, to revolt. You mentioned before the Perioikoi, but we haven't really talked about them much at this stage. I think it's probably important to put them in the picture here. What are they doing in Sparta? What's their role and place? Well, the Perioikoi are neglected by the ancient sources who only mention them in passing and typically in the context of, uh, of the army. Um, and therefore, they haven't been studied that much in modern scholarship. But uh, um, in the last uh, few years, there's been... Uh, increasing uh, focus on them and it's been realized how fundamental they are to the Spartan system. Um, to re repeat what I said briefly earlier, um, the Perioikoi are free members of communities um, scattered around uh, Spartan territory. Um, Sparta ha ha has a quite extensive territory and there are Perioikoi communities particularly around the coast of Laconia and in the uh, coast of Messenia too, and there are some uh, inland um, Perioikoi communities in, um, in Laconia itself. And um, the ancients regarded them as polis, um, in the same way uh, as you know, Athens was a polis and, and Sparta was a polis. Um, but they, they were dependent polis. They were dependent upon Sparta. Um, they had no say in uh, um, in Sparta's you know, direction of, of policy, um, but they 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 self governed their own local communities, um, but they they had to provide um, uh, troops for Sparta's armies, and you know, they do so in increasing numbers. Um, but it's easy to to regard them as um, a kind of tributary, subjugated population. Um, Easy to forget that they seem to uh, assimilate themselves to the dominant Spartan group. Um, it's very hard to distinguish the material culture from the Perioikit regions from that of Sparta. Um, quite a lot of artifacts that we regard as typically Spartan, um, for example, these um, simple uh, memorials for, for fallen soldiers, uh, we find those in uh, Perioikit areas as well as around Sparta itself. Um, so they they seem to, to share a common culture and um, a common allegiance as Lacedaemonians. They are as much Lacedaemonians as the Spartiates are. Now, um, they play a crucial role, uh, partly because of their military manpower that they supply to the army, um, but partly also because they act as a kind of informal um, uh, force keeping Sparta's large territory uh, peaceful. For the most part, they're loyal to the Spartans. Um, there are exceptions. Um, two communities in Messenia join, uh, two periodic communities in Messenia join the, uh, the Helot Revolt of the 460s. Um, and they may even, uh, according to some scholars, have actually been instigators of, of that revolt, uh, prompting the Helots to, uh, uh, to take action. Um, but for the most part, the, the Perioikoi are, are, are quite quite loyal to uh, Sparta. When enemies attack, they defend themselves, uh, for example, against the Athenian seaborne raids 
during the Peloponnesian War. And, and so I think w without the Perioikoi, um, Sparta's large territory could not have been um, controlled as, as, as easily as, as, as Sparta uh, does so for, uh, for several centuries. Can we talk a bit about the aspects of Spartan high culture too? I think, I mean, we focused on very much on groups in society and, and so on, but can we talk about things beyond the military and beyond social relations a bit? Yes. Um, it's not always easy because um, the uh, literary sources focus very much uh, upon you know, the military uh, and to a extent on social relations, uh, on politics. Um, but we can make some, some headway. So let's, let's start with the, uh, the high material culture. Um, in archaic Sparta of the uh, 8th, 7th, 6th centuries BC, um, there's evidence that, that um, Sparta was not only a normal Greek city-state, but a very rich Greek city-state. And we see this most clearly in the artefacts that have been found in the um, earlier layers, at the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia. Uh, which is uh, on the uh, northeastern fringes of uh, of the Spartan uh, villages, and um, this layer of artifact is well preserved because in the middle of the sixth century BC, um, the Spartans put a layer of sand over the sanctuary because it, it was it was quite close to the river uh, Eurotas, and so to, in order to raise the level to prevent it from flooding. They put this layer of sand over, and that sealed in the earlier artefacts. And when they were excavated by the British School uh, of Archaeology at Athens in the uh, first decade of the uh, 20th century, um, they found um, amazingly rich finds, um, um, ivory and bone uh, carvings, clearly heavily influenced by the East. And, and the ivory, of course, must itself have, have come from, um, from, from across the... Uh, uh, the Mediterranean from, 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 from Africa, and uh, also um, high-quality jewellery and uh, very well-decorated pottery and uh, a, a range of other finds or uh, various um, metal objects, and showing that in these periods, um, uh, materially, Sparta was, was, was a very, very rich culture. And this was probably achieved on the back of Sparta's recent conquest of Messenia, which gave it this huge territory and, and all, all the wealth that came, came, came from Messini. And still in the archaic period, we have evidence for um, many of the leading poets um, of, the, of the day visiting Sparta, um, performing their poetry um, in, in, in song. And so Sparta seems to be a place where um, its festivals are attended by international visitors. It can attract the, the, the leading um, artists of, 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 of the day. It's very much um, 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 a central part of, of Panhellenic culture. Now, to an extent, this um, dies away in the 5th and 4th centuries, but it doesn't die away uh, totally. Um, uh, Pindar, for example, in the early 5th century, um, um, often mentions Sparta in, in, in his, his poetry, um, and uh, the same is true of, of, of Simonides uh, as well. So Sparta nev never loses it, its, uh, its cultural elements, and in particular um, song and dance, as I mentioned earlier, um, is still um, ext extremely prominent. And we shouldn't believe what Plutarch says about the Spartans' level of literacy being very basic, just you know, to, um, just a very basic necessary learning of reading and writing. Um, we know that Spartans conducted very sophisticated, sophisticated diplomacy um, uh, and they concluded complex treaties. They um, must have been able to, uh, to, to read texts and, and, and interpret them. And so in general, there's a lot of you know, part of this mirage is the mirage of the, the unphilosophic and, and, and very illiterate Spartans. It's uh, um, very far from the truth. And we're not just talking about rich Spartans because um, the ephors, the five annual uh, executive officials of Sparta, they could be chosen from um, 
any Spartan whatsoever. This office was not limited to a rich uh, um, and better educated Spartans. So um, any any Spartan citizen um, had to be uh, have a level of literacy that would enable him to be an F or and um, uh, conduct a, a sophisticated uh, diplomacy. So. Um, in general, we need to, to get away from the, the idea that, 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 that Spartan culture um, declines totally in the classical period. Um, and even the material culture, although the artefacts uh, are not as, uh, as rich in the, in, the, in the fifth century, there are a particular a group of uh, uh, rather nice uh, statuettes um, and, and bronze bells that uh, are a notable feature of uh, fifth century uh, 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 Laconian culture, and there's even some red figure Laconian pottery too. So um, that um, Spartan culture doesn't doesn't die totally away in, in in the classical period. Connected to that, we haven't really talked much about economic matters either at this stage. So perhaps you could fill in the picture here about money and finance in Sparta and and how trade and those sorts of things worked in a in a brief way. Now this is one of the most challenging areas to um, to get a handle on. The images, of course, that the Spartans eschewed uh, money. Um, they certainly never um, coined um, until the third century BC. They had supposedly this iron currency, and you know, there is evidence for for, for iron spits. Um, but it may be that this is a, um, a symbolic matter, that it's part of the overall facade of a, an, a, an equal uniform lifestyle that um, enables the Spartans within their society to portray themselves as being roughly equals, um, homoioi, to, to, to use the Greek term, but which conceals vast differences in, in wealth. Now, the Spartans must have used um, foreign silver, either in coined or in bullion form, um, for their um, overseas dealings. Um, when they sent diplomats abroad, the Spartans uh, surely had to provide them with, with, uh, with uh, silver, uh, either bullion or currency. Um, when they when they hired mercenaries, which they increasingly did in the late fifth and early fourth centuries, uh, they must have, have paid these mercenaries in uh, in, 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 in in silver. And um, think back to um, Kiniska and her vast expenditure of wealth on the monument at Olympia, celebrating her victory. She's by no means the first Spartan to do that. Um, there was a string of Spartan victors at the uh, in the four horse chariot race at Olympia um, between 448 and 420 BC. Um, Spartans won seven out of the eight uh, uh, contests in the four horse chariot race, and they all set up their personal statues. Um, and one at least um, we know uh, commissioned uh, his statues from uh, the famous sculptor Myron of Athens. Um, they must, there must have been um, silver in coin or bullion form in in in, in private hands for these uh, victors to be able to commission the, the, these bronze monuments and, and and to pay for them. Um, now, exactly how the Spartans got hold of this wealth, um, um, how private Spartans did, is unclear. But one thing to bear in mind is that individual Spartans, particularly wealthy ones, were never isolated from the rest of the Greek world. They had um, wide-ranging uh, guest friendships, the Greek term is, is uh, Xenia, with um, uh, rich uh, men from other Greek states and even from um, non-Greek states too. And these links were maintained, uh, we see them in the archaic period, but they're maintained into the 5th and 4th centuries where they're very important for um, Sparta's um, personal di diplomacy. So they must have ha had access to, uh, to wealth coming from abroad. And if we go back to the perioikoi, um, it's often, you often read in the books that the perioikoi were, were purely you know, craftsmen, traders and so on. Um, their life was much more diverse than that. 
but the Paraguay would have had access to foreign trade and exchange and so on. And it may well be that um, um, Spartiate families develop links with um, uh, with with um, Paraguay who who are engaged in in overseas overseas economic activity, and were, were thereby able to acquire uh, silver um, either in bullion or, or in coin form and um, Plato in his laws talks about I'm sorry, in his Republic uh, talks about the Spartans um, um, storing um, private wealth in, in, in their homes and in uh, um, the dialogue um, Alcibiades I which may be a pseudo platonic dialogue but um, uh, it's a work of the 4th century BC um, the uh, the writer talks about wealth coming in into Sparta from 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 all angles, in, in, including gold and silver. So, although everyday Spartan lifestyle doesn't involve this kind of expenditure, it may well be there's lots lots of stored um, wealth in in private households that can, can be used in 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 overseas on overseas occasions. Stephen, we've covered a lot of territory there. I know there's a lot more we can talk about, but uh, we we will have another chance to to talk about this as well, um, particularly about um, the appropriations. But thank you for coming in and taking your time to talk to us in in the middle of a busy schedule. No, it's been my pleasure. It's always great to talk about Sparta.